Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of, Father's Day is always fun for me because, like, my parents go to church here. And so, like, I get to, like, experience these days with them. And so it's always kind of cool. My dad works here, so that even makes it really funny and awkward at times. Like, he's the only guy that, like, doesn't knock before they walk in my office. And it's, he's paid for it once. Um, and then... <laughs> You know, but, like, that's kind of the deal. But my dad, he's, like, I like to think that what I got from my dad was this desire to just get it done. Like, even this morning. So, um, I, I don't know if you guys know this job. I like to stand on the edge of the stage. And uh, when I was, sometimes I'll stand on the edge of the stage, this little thing just, like, pops off. And it's, like, the little trim piece. And it just popped off when I got here this morning. And my dad, like, he saw it, grabs a nail, and starts running to the stage. Like, he's just one of those guys. Like, he, he just, he gets stuff done. But Cage had already fixed it. So whatever. So that probably made him mad, actually. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, he's like, he gets it done. I'm just so thankful for him. And I, I'm so thankful for all the sacrifices that, you know, all the, all the dads make. And, you know, being a parent is, like, so unique. And I've heard it said a lot of different ways. Like, I've heard it said that being a parent is like wearing your heart on the outside of your body. And for some of you who have kids, right, like, you just, you know that. Like, you're like, man, I, I wasn't really emotional. Then I had kids, and now I feel it all. And it's like just strange. Like, it's out there. I, I've heard it also said that, that being a parent is like cleaning up after a party you were never invited to attend, which is probably really accurate for some of us. Um, I think one, one, of my ones, one of my favorite ones I liked was that being a parent is like folding a fitted sheet. Like, no one really knows how to do it, you know? Um, and they, like, they, that's a, just the pressure of parenting that you feel. And dads feel all that, you know? And then they have this pressure that they feel to try to provide for their family, to, you know, to be the man of the house, to, to give direction sometimes, and, and just to, to be, you know, who God's called them to be. There's this challenge there. And, um, and I think even being a dad, a lot of times, at least for us, is that being a dad is like, saying no to maybe what you want for the sake of the crew sometimes. And I found this meme, and I feel like it encapsulates this really well. I don't even know if you're going to laugh. I don't even care, because like, this is like the golden house to like a T. Uh, and this is the, the meme right here. Shout out to all the dads who make silent sacrifices. <laughs> that is two heels of bread. And here's what I can tell you about the golden house. No one other than me has ever eaten a heel of bread. Like, usually the way that the conversation goes will be like, like, Joanna will be like, well, I think we're going to have sandwiches for lunch today, um, but someone's going to have to eat the heel. She doesn't, like, I don't know why she says someone. <laughs> it's going to be me. Like, if I, is she, what she's saying, she's saying, Ryan, if you want lunch, that's your saying. Like, I mean, that's just kind of how it goes. And so, you know, that's kind of part of the deal. Um, and, and we're coming to a text this morning, which I think is so interesting because we're walking through Mark's gospel verse by verse. And, and the text that we're on, just like where we landed, is one that I'm sure that churches that are having Father's Day sermons are probably going to use this text. And so it really works out really well. And it's a story about a dad. And it's a story about a dad who, who is dealing with a sick child. And, and anybody who has someone they love that they're, try, that they're trying to take care of, like they can relate to this guy here in the text. And it's in Mark chapter 5, and we'll pick it up here in chapter 5, verse 21, I believe, and it, it goes a little bit like this. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, so if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, like Jesus is just going back and forth through the lake. Like, he has logged some serious nautical miles, but he's going back to the other side now. And a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him. It's a little bit of a longer text. What I want to do is I want to break it up into scenes. And the first scene that you see here in the text is you see this picture of a dad who is desperate. That it is the first scene, a desperate dad. And, you know, my kids, I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, so I've been a dad for about eight years now. And, um, 
And I've only gone to the ER like two or three times, praise the Lord. And I, I've never been in the situation where like I was afraid that something really bad was going to happen to my kid in one of those trips. The, the closest we ever came was when my son was like 18 months old and he got croup really badly. And so I, I'll never forget, we were in, like, we're all in the bathroom. The steam from the shower is making it very uncomfortable for everyone in there, except for Joanna. She likes the heat. But um, there's, like, it's going, you know, he's kind of trying to get this. I don't know. And, and so he's doing that. And then we're like, it's not getting better. And so we call the nurse on call, which is like a $400 phone call. And then you, I, we call the nurse on call. It's like a dad. Like, he just remembers the price. Like, but so we, we call the nurse on call, and, and she's like, hey, why don't, you, um, why don't you put the phone up to his mouth so I can listen to him breathe? And so we move out of the bathroom and we put the phone up to, to Jack's mouth and, and she listens to him breathe for, I don't know, a minute or so. We take the phone back and it's like, okay, so what do we do? I'll never forget. She's like, oh, you need to, you need to turn off the shower and, and go to the ER. And, and I'll never forget that car ride. I mean, you literally like listening to every single breath he took. And, and here's the thing, like in my heart of hearts, like if you, I, I wasn't like afraid he was going to die, okay? In my heart of hearts, I was like, he's going to be okay. This is just really scary. Like in my heart, that's what I felt. This dad, like he's not there. This dad is so desperate that literally his conversation with Jesus is, hey, man, if if you don't do something, my little girl dies. And here's what we know. We know by the way, this the text. He's right. That, that if Jesus doesn't do something, if he doesn't show up, little girl dies. And, and, and here's why we know he's desperate. Because it says his title. He was a synagogue ruler. So, so basically, like, this guy, he's on the other team. The synagogue rulers, those are the people who are right now making the case to crucify Jesus. That the synagogue rulers, these are the people who hate what Jesus is doing. They're the ones who are watching Jesus, just looking for a reason to like catch him or accuse him. Jairus is on that team. But man, when you've got a sick kid, you start to question everything. When you've got a sick, it's a different story when your child is sick. And so he's thinking, in my desperation, I'm going to try something that completely goes against my worldview. And he goes. And I think that's so interesting because it shows us something about faith. Is some of you, like you might even be here today because you're desperate. Your life isn't what you thought it would be. And so you decided, I'm going to come to church. And maybe some of you, like, the reason why you've been coming to church is because you, you were desperate and Jesus helped you. And, that, like, that's fine. The, the beauty of the story is that you can come to him in desperation, but you don't stay there. I, I mean, even as you think about, like, this, like, he comes in desperate. And the beauty of Jesus is that nowhere in the text does Jesus say, tell me about your friends who are going to kill me. That nowhere in the text does he say, so theologically, like, what do you really think about why I came? That there's, there's no questioning him. There's no like, hey, so are you on my team now? Because if, like, none of that. That all you see Jesus do is he's like, well, little girl's sick. So I'm going to go. And so the dad's desperate. They start traveling together. And it'd be cool if that was kind of where the story ended, I guess, but I think it's actually cool that it doesn't because what comes next is the next scene is an interruption. They're, they're walking to this sick girl and they're interrupted by someone who is equally desperate. Look at this here. It says, And a great crowd followed Jesus and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She'd heard all the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, 
if I touch his garments, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples, snarky as ever, you see the crowd pressing around you and you say, who touched me? They're like, there's a bunch of people touching you, Jesus. And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while Jesus was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house, from Jairus' house, some who said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Have a moment where like, <laughs> you do everything right and then someone else gets what you wanted it's really hard to be happy for them, isn't it? I mean, that's this situation. I mean, put yourself in, in Jairus' situation here, like in his shoes. He stepped out in faith and switched teams. He knew Jesus was coming on the boat, so he got there early. He was able to push through the crowd and get Jesus' attention. Not only that, but he was able to actually convince Jesus to follow him. He's done everything right. And even putting yourself in his shoes too, like he doesn't, he doesn't know or understand Jesus' power in the same way that we do. Like we have all of scripture and so we're able to be like, he doesn't know. I mean, for all he knows that Jesus heals like a battery. The power goes out and has to recharge. I mean, so he doesn't know. And so he's sitting here, he came to Jesus and this person was healed and he's gotta be thinking, You've got to be kidding me. My daughter is 12. And you stopped for her? I stepped out in faith. I switched teams. And you stopped for her? Do you not realize how this is going to go over with my friends? And here's what it shows, it shows something about faith that's really unfortunate, I think. Sometimes you're going to do everything right and you're not going to get anything you want. Like sometimes you're going to be like, man, I, I did it the right way and that didn't go the way I had planned. And sometimes that's how it works. And, and as desperate as this guy was, okay, the woman was just as desperate. I, I mean, look at how the text describes her a lot. I think it's in verse 25. It says this. This is there, this woman, she had a discharge of blood for 12 years. I've had a sinus thing for the last month and I'm just like, God, when are you going to take this away from me? Like, that, I, like, I can't imagine 12 years. Who had suffered much under many physicians. She'd spent all that she had and she was no better, but she grew worse. You know those people that have problems and they complain about their problems and then you're like, hey, well, have you tried this? Or you, and then you discover after talking to them, they haven't done anything to try to fix their problems. They just like to complain about their problems. This isn't this lady. Like, this is a person who's done everything that she can to try to fix this issue of blood that she was dealing with. That she, I mean, gosh, she spent all the money that she had. And all that's happened is she's gotten worse, never better. And when it says there that she suffered much under the care of physicians, I think it's talking about the type of treatments that she had to endure. That in, in, the, in the Talmud, which is the oral law, which is not the Bible. Like it's the, it's the stuff that the, really that Jesus would argue with the Jewish leaders about where they would say, this is the scripture. And Jesus is like, no, it's not. So it's like that, that book. They had like treatments prescribed for this type of healing, like for this type of issue. And, and some of the treatments that they would, encourage this woman to do that she would have had to pay for would be things like drinking a goblet of wine containing a compounded, fa compounded rubber. <laughs> Alum and garden crocuses. 
Or taking a dose of Persian onions cooked in wine administered with the summons, arise out of you flow of blood. Or the physicians would, have, would prescribe sudden shock. I don't know what that means. Like maybe someone's like in a corner somewhere and they jump out and try to scare and think that'll stop it. <laughs> and then this is my favorite one, that this is what they would, this is like first century medicine. They, carrying the ash of an ostrich egg in a ceremonial cloth. Like, this is what she would have had to endure, and all she has now is a wall of treatments that haven't worked. That's it. She's actually gotten worse. And then she hears that Jesus is in town, and she decides, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to push through the crowd, and if I touch his garment, I think that'll do the trick. And she does, and it does. And this is what I love about Jesus, is that Jesus will not waste a healing. That he knows, he knows something very true about her and about us. And it's that eventually there will be a disease that she will not recover from. Eventually something will happen and she will die. And so what Jesus wants her to know is he wants her to know that her issue isn't, her real issue, it isn't the bleeding. It's something in her soul. And this is why Jesus stops to talk to her after she touches him. Look at what he says. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He's saying, I need you to know why you were healed. Not because of some magic, not because of some treatment. No, I need you to know that your faith in me is what made you well. And if you remain in me, then you will get peace. So that someday, when she doesn't recover from something, whatever it might be, because Jesus stopped, her soul was healed so that she can be with him forever. Now, as beautiful as that is, and as much as I'm like, man, that's so cool that he would, he would do that, well, you go back to Jairus. And as much as that conversation is great for us, for him, he's got to be thinking. The fact that you stopped and talked to her is why my daughter's dead. I mean, because the, the conversation would have been longer than just that sentence. And he's got to be thinking, as he, Jesus just keeps talking to her, like, okay, man, come on. I mean, you ever have that moment, you know, where you're like, you're rushed, you want something to happen, like you got somewhere you got to be, and then you're, you're in traffic, and the person in front of you stops at the yellow light, and you're like, it's Missouri, we go through red lights here, like, what are you doing? And so, I mean, like, you're like in a hurry, you're like, when you're like sitting there, and you go to the, the line at the grocery store, because you got people coming over to your house in an hour, and you just had to pick up something real quick, and you're like, you're in the line, and, and you realize the lady in front of you gets out all the coupons, <laughs> And then there's someone behind you and you're just like stuck. You ain't going. And you're like, oh my gosh, how am I, I'm never going to get home. She's arguing about Brussels. Like what is going, like that's what's going on. Like, like this guy has got to be sitting here thinking, dude, come on. She gets it. Come on. My daughter's 12. She's an adult. Come on, let's go. Jesus just keeps talking. And while he's talking, people come to him and they're like, hey man, you might as well leave Jesus alone. She's dead. Quite the interruption. But the beauty of the text is it doesn't end there. There's another scene. And the last scene that we see is what I would just call the other healing. It's, and honestly, it's, it's, it's more than a healing. Look at this in verse 35. It says, they... There came from the ruler's household those who said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing that, overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, said to Jairus, right after he got word that his daughter died, do not fear, only believe. I love that. Like before Jairus has the chance to do something stupid, before he has the chance to walk away, before he has the chance to communicate a lack of faith, Jesus is like, it's cool, man. I've got it. 
Like, if, you're, if you're a parent, like, you can relate to that, right? Like, part of parenting is, like, stopping your kids before you do, they do the dumb things you know they're thinking about doing, right? Like, okay, you're standing next to the stairs with a sled. No, like, don't, it's not a good idea. Like, he's like, before anything, I, I need you to know. Like, no, th- just trust me. And, he, and what he does is he, he interrupts them. And, and what he does in his interruption is he's calling them to an intense faith. Specifically, Jairus is saying, hey, don't be afraid. I just need you to believe. He's saying that the faith that it took you to come to me was something. It's incredible. I'm calling you to have even more. I'm saying that what I'm about ready to do is going to take even more faith. And as the story goes on, you see that this situation is bleak. Look at this in verse 37. It says, and he, Jesus, allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw the commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, Jesus said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but, but she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. And this shows us how hopeless the situation is and how everybody connected to it, with the exception of Jesus and maybe mom and dad, they thought the girl was dead. And the thing that you see there with the mourners is you see with the mourners that this is not like, um, this isn't family gathering that are crying. This is a cultural thing. That in the first century, when someone would die, what they would do is they would hire mourners to come and mourn for you. You thought Instagram influencer was a weird job. Like, this is what they did in the first century. And, and you would have even the, the poorest person would be provided to mourners. And so what, what Jesus is walking into, Jairus is a synagogue ruler, so he's probably doing okay. And so there's probably quite the crowd there. And the mourning, it's not just like people crying, like wiping tears from their eyes, but it was actually kind of elaborate and dramatic that what they would be doing is they would be, like William Lane says this in his commentary, they would be like basically like singing back and forth to each other with like elaborate like hand clapping, like very weird stuff going on. And you know that like it's not sincere mourning because how quickly they go from mourning to their laughing at Jesus. Like clearly they are there to do a job. They're not sad, they're just getting paid to be sad. It's this bleak situation. Everyone thinks the girl is dead. But then Jesus comes and does something that is nothing short of the miraculous. Look at this. It says, But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. That's the text. And you have five people who go into this room who know exactly what happened. And, and I like the line there where it says that they were over, they were immediately were overcome with amazement. That part of the sense that Mark is communicating with that is like, they didn't know what to do. Like they're in the presence of this girl that everybody thinks is dead, that is dead. And now she's not. Like, I think that they would have done what any of us would have done in that situation where we would just be like, so that was something. What? Like, I mean, what do you do? And you kind of get the sense they're all kind of shocked. And then Jesus, like, in an act of compassion, is like, why don't you give her something to eat? <laughs> because something about raising from the dead makes you very hungry, I guess. And so, and it's there. And here's the, the text. And <clears throat> and this is a beautiful text, and I think it's, it's a, I, I love it when, like, the sovereignty of God works in our sermon calendar in this way, because it's a, it is Father's Day, and it's a story about a dad, and, but as much as it's a story about a dad, it's, it's a story that we all can learn from, 
And as I just think that what he shows us, what Jairus shows us, is he shows us in this text what it looks like to walk by faith. And I just give you a few thoughts of what that looks like. The first thing is this, is that walking by faith handles detours. That when you walk by faith, you have to realize that part of walking by faith isn't always getting what you want. I think we wish it was. I think we wish it was like this, you know, well, hey, we just, yeah, this is what you wanted. This is what you get. This is a straight line there. But, but Jairus' story shows us anything but that. He walks by faith, comes to Jesus, watches someone else get healed, hears his daughter dies. And like, that's the walk of faith. Like, it's like this. And some of you, like, that might be where you are right now. Like, you would say that my life feels like a detour. You'd be thinking, you know, where I am right now is not where I thought I would be and is definitely not where I hoped I would be. That part of walking by faith is able to zoom out and say, you know what, though that might be where I am, I trust that he's going to get me through it. I trust that he's going to be able to get me to the other side. Because if the story shows us anything, it shows us what happens. It shows us that as we walk by faith, the story, our story, will end like the story of the little girl with the resurrection. And when the resurrection comes, when it comes to us, we're going to see our problems differently. We're going to see our challenges differently. And walking by faith, I mean, it believes that, it sees that, it hopes for that. And it knows that even though we walk through things that we wouldn't sign up for or that we wouldn't want, he's right there with us through the detours. His, Jairus was by his side the whole time. And he, he wants to be by your side the whole time too. So you see that. The other thing you see about walking by faith is you see that walking by faith believes big things. I mean, in this story, you have, you have a, a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And you have a little girl who's 12 years old. I don't think that was accidental. And who rose from, like, that's, those are bona fide miracles. And what walking by faith does is it causes us to look at the problems in our lives and believe that God can work powerfully in those problems. And, and like, I mean, I, really, like, to the same level that we see in the text, and, and that's not to me, like, Jesus says it this way in John's gospel, in John chapter 14, he says it this way. He says this, he says, um, John 14, is it 14? Yeah, 14, 12. Oh, there's, yep, it says this. Um, he says, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. That, that for us, like we can believe, like well, the reason we have people come forward for prayer every week, it isn't because we like want you to feel good. It's because we believe that like, his power is available. That we, I, honestly, it's my belief and my conviction that some people haven't experienced God do the miraculous in their life because they haven't been willing to step out in faith and to trust God to do the miraculous in their life. Jesus says, you'll do even greater things than I did. Trust me, be willing to step out. And you also see from this text, like that idea that there's plenty of power to go around. It's really hard for us, especially as parents, when you see someone else like get what you want, especially with your kids. And what you see here in the text is you see that Jesus can do both. He can work in, in, in their life and he can work in your life. There's no shortage of his power to go around. We just have to be willing to trust and believe that he can do big things. But then finally, as we look at this text in its totality, we see that walking by faith, it brings people to Jesus. That if you truly walk by faith, you bring people to Jesus. I, I think of the dads in the room. The most important thing that you can do for your family is bring them to Jesus. More important than giving your kid every opportunity, more important than making sure they have everything they want, more important than making sure that you, have, the most important thing that you can do for your family is to bring them to Jesus. That's it. And, and, and really, that's true for anyone, though. The, if, if you love someone, if you care about them, the most important thing that you can do for them is to bring them to Jesus. And if you do, 
their story is the same story as that little girl who that dad brought to Jesus. I mean, I think about that. That girl, like she grew up. And you know, like let's say she lived to be 80. Let's just say that, like you're just 20 years old, doing whatever 20 year olds do in the first century and someone's talking to her and they're like, hey, what's your story? Her story would be very similar. It'd be very simple. She would say, well, I was gonna die my dad brought me to Jesus and so now I'm alive and then and then she's let's say she continues to live she lives to be 80 she's 40 she meets some people for the first time like a dinner party or something and they're like hey tell us tell us your story what's your story and she would say well yeah I was 12 years old I was gonna die my dad brought me to Jesus and now now I'm alive and even when she's like 79, getting close to the end, like, and, and someone's talking to her and she's like, you know, I've, I've actually had an incredible life. I'm like, well, tell me why, why? And she'd say, well, I was 12 and I was gonna die. But my dad brought me to Jesus and so now I'm alive. And in a million years, in a million years, and we're sitting there in heaven and she's there and we're like, so like, you're the one, huh? Tell, what's your story? And she's going to say, it's the craziest thing. I was 12. I was going to die. But my dad brought me to Jesus, and so now I'm really, really alive. And the only reason why I'm here, able to experience all of this and able to talk to you, is because my dad brought me to Jesus. And that's the power that's available to all of us when we bring someone to Jesus. That's, that's the power that we have to change someone's story. That in a million years, when we're all sitting up there just like talking, doing whatever we're doing up there, someone might say of you, the craziest thing, I was going to die, but they brought me to Jesus, and so I'm alive. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we're thankful for the power that's available to us to bring people to Jesus. I'm thankful, God, that we're in this room probably because someone brought us to Jesus. Or someone brought us here this week. I don't know, God, but here's what I pray. I pray that, God, that inside of all of us, there'd be a, a fire to bring people to you, to care about eternity in that type of way where we look at our circles and we realize the most loving thing that we can do for them is to bring them to you. And I just pray for this room, God. I, I don't know where everyone's at. But maybe they're here and the, the reality of their situation is that they're not right with you. That their faith isn't in the fact that you died for them, that you rose for them. That, that you, their faith isn't in the fact that because you did that, that they too will do the same thing. That they just haven't put their trust in you in that way. They haven't asked you to forgive them of their sins. They're just, they're sitting there in the seat and they're not right with you. Then God, I, I pray by the power of your spirit that you would help them to put their faith in Jesus. That they would bring themselves to you and God, that you would save them. We thank you, God, for your desire to save. We thank you, God, for your desire to work. Help us, God, to experience that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for watching us on YouTube today. We hope that the content that you heard helped you know Jesus better. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and to click the bell icon so that you'll get notified every time our channel drops a new video. If you would like to partner with us and what God is doing here at New Life, there are three ways that you can give. You can give by mailing a check to the church. You can give by going to giving.nlspringfield.com or you can text 84321 with the amount that you'd like to give. And if you would like to connect with us in any other way, you can visit us at nlspringfield.com, click on the connect tab, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. We'll see you next week.